Okay, I, I suggest we, we get started. Um, sort of welcome to another interesting Hyperledger Global Forum session. Uh, the title is Does Industrial Asset Management Provide Good Use Cases for Verifiable Credentials and Distributed Ledgers? Uh, it's a provocative question uh, in a way. Um, my name is Andreas Kind. Um, I uh, am in charge of cybersecurity technology here in Siemens. Uh, it's a global team that covers cybersecurity technologies on all levels um, of the Siemens enterprise, uh, the Siemens production, and uh, Siemens products and solutions. Uh, it's a, a quite an interesting field. What brings us here to Hyperledger uh, Global Forum is um, a really very concrete problems in industrial uh, production uh, around machine identities, around extending trust into production environment, physical context, environments, uh, things like energy networks, things like uh, um, uh, train systems, factories, uh, city infrastructure, and so on, uh, and any kind of trustworthiness around sustainability. That's another important topic for us here. Uh, so with this, I will hand over to my colleague, Oliver. Uh, he will uh, present uh, then the, the topic. Right, yeah, Are there. Uh, I hope you can hear me. And uh, I'm happy to uh, talk you uh, uh, to talk about industrial automation. And uh, I would like to try to answer the question: What could the industrial automation have to do with things like verifiable credentials and distributed ledgers? Uh, Andreas and me both are Siemens employees, and Siemens is a global champion in industrial automation. Um, Start off with a few slides about industrial automation, what it is, and uh, to, to establish a common ground for the discussion on uh, what it could have to do with verifiable credentials, distributed ledgers, and so on. First of all, what you see here is uh, distinguished individual in the industrial automation components. Since the dimension is not quite clear, uh, I think it uh, would be something like 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters, so not too big. Uh, and uh, this actually is a piece, one piece of an industrial automation component, and this is used as a part of machine. A machine could be something like an industrial robot, and uh, that uh, becomes part of things uh, which are production cells or sites, and these components, uh, uh, machines, production cells, sites, are used all over uh, uh, manufacturing, all over um, uh, utilities, uh, process industries, and so on and so forth. So that's kind of a common component which is kind of ubiquitously uh, used. Now, it has some properties. So first of all, um, there are components which are called actuators and sensors, which actually interact with the physical world. And this is one class of industrial automation component and there are other classes of components which control such actuators and sensors so these are the most important classes of components all these components have a, a chassis they are tangible so it's not like a piece of software that you get by download it's kind of something that is shipped to you um, it has to withstand harsh environments uh, it has of course identification uh, and the identification comes in two flavors. You can identify such a product as a part of a cohort of a class of components. So there is like a product type and order ID specific information by which you identify a whole class of components. And there's also uh, in the identif identification on an individual in instance level. Um, it of course uses computing technologies. And all flavors that you know from computing, like programs, algorithms, state engines, processors, memories, are part of such components. Uh, it also, of course, uses networking uh, because it, it's used in a distributed in environment uh, where it interacts with other such components and uses networking for this interaction. And uh, uh, something where uh, things are a little bit different from some IoT environments, uh, most of them are in many cases, they are real-time requirements, which means that uh, the interactions in such a system have to happen according to uh, certain boundaries with respect to time. So that's an industrial automation component. 
uh, such a component, of course, has a life cycle. And on the left hand side, you see top down uh, a, a, a rough chart of its life cycle. It starts with the manufacturing phase where uh, um, by the manufacturer of such components, the actual instance is manufactured. Then it's kind of shipped. It's, the shipping is not shown here. It arrives at the customer site and then uh, it's kind of bootstrapped. So it must be installed. It must be commissioned. Then it gets into operation uh, where uh, the actual process or, or automation process is running. Um, and then there uh, could be one or more maintenance phases and there can be an offboarding phase. Of course, it's not, not so easy to read here um, uh, from, a, from a kind of a space perspective. Uh, the interest of the customer is, of course, to maximize the operational phase. So the idea is, of course, this component should run 24 hours a day, uh, seven days a week, and uh, 52 uh, weeks a year. And when this is happening, some data is produced. So next thing, we look at the data objects. And here it's important to understand that we have different classes of data, which are associated with the cycle. Um, so when the component is being manufactured, then data objects are being generated, which we call product master, master data. And think of things like items would be the serial number for the product instance, or things like the MAC address which is bound to the component, uh, and also information like who's the manufacturer, what type of component was manufactured, what was the order idea, which hardware software version do we have. During the bootstrapping phase, we have another class of data which is being established, which we call deployment master data. And here we have things like application names, could be also IP addresses, or even the physical location which are relevant for this component and its use. During the operational phase, we have operational data that is being created and that kind of reports on the performance of the component as well as the health of the component. And kind of the maintenance phase and the offboarding phases, they kind of can touch certain sets of information, but the, the, we already talked about the most important ones. Uh, then we have different stakeholders. That's also important to understand. Um, uh, it starts simple. Uh, the, uh, first of all, we have two. Uh, 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 columns here, uh, we have the producer of the data and the consumer of the data. So it starts simple during the uh, manufacturing, the data is produced by the manufacturer or on behalf of the manufacturer. And we have a couple of other roles which uh, can be the consumers. So uh, we see another actor in such an industrial automation system could be a distributor or the machine builder. The system integrator who kind of builds the production cell or plant on behalf of the owner and the owner operator. So we have different roles along the value chain in, in industrial automation. And uh, here you can see that the production and consumption changes with respect to uh, where we are. Uh, the short summary is there is no single entity which can give and provide all information that is relevant for an industrial automation component along its life cycle. And we will see that that's an important uh, aspect to, to the challenge uh, and to, to its solution that we discuss in a moment. Right, so next question is the customers. So the, uh, the, the owners and operators of industrial automation equipment, what do they actually ask for? And uh, there is a 1A requirement, and I think that's pretty obvious. That should be a no-brainer. They are interested in runtime performance, so 9 or 99.9 .9 availability of the component, and as well as predictable and available uh, operations of that. That's clearly the number 1A requirement. There is a not so obvious number B, 1B requirement, and that's asset management. And to give you an example here, uh, we we provided some information from a recent RFI uh, request for information by a major car manufacturer, one of the top five uh, car manufacturers, and that's what they are asking for. And let's take a minute to understand. So first of all, and I hope you can see my cursor, I go to, to the sub -bullets. They give a list of information items they are mostly interested in, and we can see by roughly checking it, that's kind of a union between the production master data and the deployment master data. So they want to have both. They want to have 
information from the class of production master data as well as information uh, deployment master data. They want to have this automatically. So they want to have an automated process which does not depend on much manual interactions or interference. Um, that's, that's important. They want to have it for each and every component and the number of such components can be quite high. So it, it's, uh, you e easily have a five digit number of industrial automation components within a single factory. Uh, if you look at uh, uh, a user owner like a car manufacturer and the production of some cars. There are also smaller deployments. There are also deployments with four digit numbers. And here maybe an example could be uh, even vessel equipment or ship equipment is one of uh, a major market. And I guess the numbers typically there would be four, uh, four digit number. Uh, of course, there are also smaller ones, maybe three or even two digit numbers of industrial automation components. But anyhow, no matter what the number is, they ask for each of that component should provide its information automatically. They also, um, next thing that is important, um, uh, in a factory, typically the components of multiple manufacturers come together. Uh, so it's never a one uh, a manufacturer thing there. Uh, typically it's a two digit number between 10 and 20 manufacturers that come together and deliver equipment for a single factory. They want to have it for all of them and they want to have it in a convenient way, which means they need to have standards for uh, getting this information. And here they already give an idea on what would be the preferred, their preferred idea of the standards they would like to use to get this information. Well, that's what the customer asks for. Uh, and again, the information was it's a recent requirement. Now let's double check where we are. So the question is, are these customer demands fulfilled already? And here we look at three dimensions. First dimension is the sourcing. So can we get the information at all? And it's uh, structured according to the ideas the customer has. They suggest something like a Profinet identification and maintenance data record. Profinet is one of the important field buses uh, which are used to, uh, to control actuators and sensors. SNMP is an ITF standard for network management. OPC UAA is an industry domain standard uh, for uh, industrial components. And here you can see the overall assessment would be we have a far partial coverage of the sourcing. Looks like the Profinet ENM data is best in providing coverage, but they only cover the Profinet specific data. As soon as you have an industrial component which runs Profinet plus X, you have coverage for Profinet, but you don't have coverage for the plus X. So overall it's partial. Next. Um, if we uh, so Andreas and me, so if we look at uh, the, the level of protection of information or of proving that information, the question is, are we covered here? And the answer is not yet. Typically, for instance, Profinet ENM data is self-asserted information without any protection at all. So it's actually pretty simple to create for, uh, to, to, to kind of create fake equipment claiming or pretending to be Siemens equipment because there is no uh, uh, safeguard for, for this INM data as of, as of today. And that belongs to the class of self-asserted information. So the component tells itself about its own identification and maintenance status, and it's um, not protected. Uh, if it would be third-party data, uh, also uh, typically things are unprotected. So the proving part is not yet fulfilled. The automating part, partially fulfilled. And here again, we have the same issue that we talked uh, before. Uh, uh, if you look at components which run Profinet and only Profinet, it's pretty much fulfilled. If you look at more advanced components which run other stacks in addition to a Profinet stack, uh, it's uh, not fulfilled right now. So we have a clear customer requirement. It sounds simple and fair. If we double check the current status, it looks like it's not yet there where the customer wants us to be. So the question is, how can we fill the gap? And now we switch to the uh, trust technologies uh, which emerge from the W3C and which are also used in the blockchain context because they give us 
uh, a potential and a uh, first of all a potential and also a new potential when we compare them to classical approaches to uh, across them. Um, we have two candidates here which look uh, appealing to us. There is the W3C verifiable credentials. Uh, here's a bit of generic information on that slide about verifiable credentials. I guess uh, for most of you there is not much too much news on that slide. So let, <clears throat> maybe let's quickly concentrate on that chart here. So if we translate that to industrial automation, the component which is called holder here would become the industrial automation component. That would be the holder. Uh, the verifier here would be typically the owner, the operator, or maybe the system integrator uh, who uh, kind of builds up and takes care of running a production cell or a production uh, site. The next thing is, uh, based on what we talked already, uh, they need production data. Production data is understood by the manufacturer. They need deployment data. Deployment data is understood by the machine builder or by, by others. So we will have multiple issuers. So in our understanding, we have one component, which is the holder. Probably we have one verifier. I hope you can see my, my mouse cursor. I move it a little bit. But we have multiple issuers making statements about that component and the verifier asking questions about that and uh, here you can already see uh, uh, with a classical model here uh, the verifier probably would have to ask multiple questions to understand deployment data as well as production master data uh, 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 the, the appealing thing here is we can uh, transform things, we can even synthesize things, so we can have multiple credentials issued to the component, which gets synthesized into a single presentation. And uh, this, is a, uh, this is a good fit to, to, to our constraints. Uh, it also allows to kind of um, do further uh, uh, transformation operations. So this uh, proposal for industrial automation, Along with the verifiable credentials, we have the decentralized identifiers. And here it's important to understand, as of now, they provide an identification fabric, which is used in the context of variable verifiable credentials. So they are used for, uh, uh, in order to refer to uh, verifiable credential schema objects or to actual uh, concrete objects. Uh, they right now do not yet, uh, 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 or they are not related to the classical identification information which exists in the uh, industrial automation since the decades. And next slide is what could a solution look like? Uh, actually, we have pretty straightforward building blocks uh, uh, which already come out of the W3C documents. Steps. So things start with an issuance step, which means the issuer issues credentials to the industrial automation component. The, indust uh, the industrial automation component is the holder here. And uh, we equip them with verifiable credentials. Uh, again here, uh, this is a recurring thing. It's because we have multiple actors able to say something about the uh, industrial automation component, while the owner operator is asking for all, we have multiple uh, or we believe there will be multiple, uh, in the issuance steps, there will be multiple issuers providing objects, verifiable credential objects to a single industrial automation component. This is uh, addressed already in the W3C verifiable credential data model. Next step would be the presentation step. So I'm interested, I'm curious to understand something about my industrial automation component. And in order to do that, I interact with the component and I challenge it to present uh, uh, either a credential or, or a verified presentation. And I do this in the role of an owner operator, for instance. That's also addressed in the W3C verifiable credential data model. Then there's the verification step. Once I obtained my verifiable presentation, I need to check it, of course, uh, with respect to its authenticity, uh, with respect to its timeliness, uh, things like that. Uh, that's already covered in the W3C data model. Uh, then, uh, after checking the actual information that I got, I must the overall context that I operate. Like, was now I understand that this component has this and that serial number, 
but is it supposed to uh, be operated within my production cell or site? That would be the next question, the validation step. And here, the W3C verification, uh, verifiable credential data model intentionally abstains from uh, elaborating that. So they formulate, they talk about the validation step, which is a good idea. Uh, and but they abstain from detailing it because that becomes industry specific. Right, so we get the building blocks more or less. Um, now question is, um, will that be uh, um, uh, an exercise that is simple to do and we just have to copy and paste what we get? Or do we have to do some lifting? And if we have to do some lifting, uh, is this heavy lifting? And here the answer to this question is, uh, yes, we believe some lifting is needed. And this concerns both uh, actors, uh, or especially the, the technology and solution providers. We talk about in a minute about the users of the, of the solutions. Uh, but actually, it's not a rocket science that has to be done. And the following uh, items, uh, the work items that have to be uh, addressed in doing this lifting. And again, the lifting here, or the, the assumption is the lifting starts with the artifacts that we get from the W3C, such as uh, decentralized identifiers and verifiable credentials. And uh, for the verifiable credentials, uh, uh, the, 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 the proposal is, or the assumption is, we need to have specific schemas for the industrial automation domains. Uh, here we have to take care that with respect to IEEE standards, there is already a relevant piece which was established some 10 years ago, which is called Secure Device Identity, which talks about or which, which suggests the equipment of industrial automation components with uh, objects which are backed by cryptography, especially asymmetric cryptography, which is your certificates. So that has to be kind of weaved together which is uh, our first item here. It will be uh, standardization on how verifiable credentials can be presented and verified. We already have lots in the W3C standards, but still here, how do I discover the endpoints or public, uh, publicize the endpoints uh, from which I can get that information that, that looks in this dimension. Uh, we talked about the validation uh, procedure, so the things that uh, have to happen or should happen after the actual verification, technical verification, so the overall context validation, uh, that's uh, something like I said before, that's de-scoped for a good reason from the W3C standards that has, would have to be filled. Uh, th there have to be some endpoints on the components uh, which have to be uh, prescribed and described and specified uh, together with the functionality. Uh, uh, there also needs to be a clear understanding on what the verif verifier role is. So is this like a like a, an automated component which runs continuously uh, in, in, in a production cell? Or is it more uh, kind of a, an, an operator tool thing that is being used? So things like that would have to be specified and, 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 and identified. And also, uh, it looks like that the overall accreditation of the issuer organizations uh, as, as legal entities would be a help. For the decentralized identifiers, um, there needs to be, or there should be, from our perspective, a consideration on how should decentralized identifiers look like, which are able to protect existing investments. Uh, as I told you before, uh, identification information already is there. And there is not really an interest to uh, kind of uh, yeah, to to go back to zero here and restart the whole thing with an empty page. So uh, the decentralized identifier models probably have to take into account that there are already there's, there are identification schemes uh, which carry a value uh, both for the manufacturer organizations as well as for the owner organizations. It also looks like that the DID documents should become non-public in the industrial automation case. So with that, we are able to uh, sum up what we talked about. So, and here, uh, what, what, what are the things that you should take away now? Uh, number one, industrial automation, and here we talk about terms like IoT, for Internet of Things and OT for operational technology. 
Uh, and here the differentiation probably is uh, IoT usually takes the, uses the IP stack and OT often uh, works with OT uh, IP stack. No matter what it is, uh, we collectively call it industrial automation. And yes, there are auto interesting use cases for verifying uh, The use cases that we see, which are interested, interesting and relevant here, belong to the cluster of asset management. The quotation here gives you a short definition of uh, our understanding of asset management, which, which was taken from Wikipedia. So I think that should be pretty clear, I guess, to everybody. And uh, the, the importance, next thing that is relevant here, the importance of asset management kind of is self-evident. Uh, in industrial automation, we look at the owner operator, which typically are legal organizations. This is not you and me at home, which uh, are interested in a smart home solution. So these are legal entities which uh, uh, manufacture some goods or, or produce some, uh, some utilities. And uh, usually uh, they are public. And, and uh, uh, the industrial automation components provide capital goods for them. And with respect to that, they need, of course, uh, to understand uh, what they have and in which kind of state and shape that is. And this is an old requirement. Uh, so asset management in industrial automation is not new. It is solved, uh, but actually it's kind of old school solved, like spreadsheets, papers, people walking around. So the, the asset management solutions that we are aware of uh, actually lack digi digi uh, digitization right now. And um, when uh, we would use the emerging technologies, trust technologies, especially verified credentials and distributed ledgers in a smart way, uh, then we could fill the gap. So asset management is important. And here we try to, to establish the slogan, yes, it's there. It's kind of analog. It's done. It's happening. It's analog. It's not net digitized. It probably has to be digitized, and the, the technologies we were discussing can fill and uh, can provide an important uh, or can play an important role in doing that. So, expectation management is also important. Uh, when we think about how we could exploit this potential, uh, when for those who are acting or working for technology and solution providers, uh, the message would be, or the expectation management would be, uh, what we see that we can get from uh, from organizations like W3C is something I would uh, term uh, raw material for solving industrial automation use cases. And that's not yet a turnkey solution. And that was the slide about the lifting and whether it's heavy or not. So something has to be done in on top. Yes, some lifting, but I guess, uh, or we believe it's it's not really having lifting. Uh, for those who are on the side of technology or solution providers, uh, then there will be some procedural changes. So how asset management is happening and being done can and will change if this kind of process uh, takes place. Uh, but there is no fundamental change with respect to whether or not I have to take care about that. And that were the slides that we wanted to present and, uh, to you. So thanks a lot. And if there are some questions, uh, I'm happy to try to answer them. Yeah, exactly. Please post your questions into the uh, chat. I know we have only a couple of seconds. So you just uh, reminded us. Uh, so one quick question from somebody. Otherwise, feel free to reach out to Oliver or me. Uh, we would be quite interested in uh, exchange on, on machine identities. Uh, there's a question from uh, uh, Simon. How do you verify that the information about the industrial automation component is maintained correctly? This. Yeah, I'm not sure if I have uh, to ask a question back. Um, 
at, at the end of the day, uh, there are issuers. And of course, you kind of have to trust the issuers to, their, to do their job uh, correct. So um, uh, we are, uh, um, uh, uh, there, there are some contextual checks which can be done. There is no trust out of nothing. So uh, in, 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 uh, in my understanding, it's a technology that helps to assess and validate the information, uh, putting it into context, uh, evaluating into context. But at the end of the day, uh, uh, you have to trust the manufacturers that you want to work with or the machine builder. And uh, that, that would be my take here right now. Okay, good. Yeah, then I guess, Oliver, we have to wrap up um, and say thanks for your, for your attention uh, and the interest in the topic.